there's a barrier that Asian kids face that others don't. And it's almost as if you feel like you don't belong. It's almost as if, should I be here? Am I, am I cheating? Do, do I, am I supposed to be here? That's, that's a hidden sort of barrier that, that Asian kids face that you shouldn't have to face. Because let's face it, it's hard enough as it is. When I saw that, I thought, you know what? That's when I want to be able to become a footballer. Mike Lowen inspired me. There are two issues here. One is what might be called the host community attitude of the majority community and the other is the attitude of the Asian community. I think that's a bit further than that. Let's face it, there is racism in society still, which means that there's racism within our game. So there is that, if you like, that barrier. If a parent doesn't take him down to the training session, how is he going to play? Not every Indian person eats chapati and curry every night. I see lots coming from the academy up to 16, not many going past that stage. The passion British Asians have for English football is unquestionable. There has been a major growth in their visible presence on the terraces of football grounds up and down the country. But why are they struggling to make the transition onto the field of play for football league clubs? This ain't gonna be easy. We travel to Wakefield to talk to an Asian player trying to make his way in the professional game. Shani Abasi is a Pakistan under 23 international. He is currently on the books of Evo Sticks side, Osset Albion. Well, this is, yeah, this is a famous hall that we used to come through every single day after school. All the friends, all my friends, we used to get together, it used to be a good 20 of us. We used to come through here and we used to come play football here for God knows how many hours, until it got dark. And security used to come and kick us off, even though we wasn't doing anything wrong. We were just some lads who wanted, to, who wanted the game of football. And uh, th so we thought, you know what, because normally we used to climb over first, but I think a few lads got hurt climbing over. So some of the older lads, they thought, you know what, we're not doing anything wrong. We just want a game. No, one, no one's even using this for anything. Mm. And, you know, obviously it's going to keep us out of trouble. We won a game every day after school. When Michael Owen scored that, Argent when he scored that goal against Argentina, the first one, when I saw that, I thought, you know what, that's when I want to be become a footballer. I think, I think Mike, Michael Owen inspired me. There is the notion that Asian players lack the physical stature to make it in the professional game. This school of thought has been dismissed by Inventive Sports co-founder Just Jussel, FA ambassador and former Football League referee Janelle Singh, and broadcaster, writer, and former BBC sports editor, Mihir Bose. They talk to coaches, they look at the young players, and they think a young black player will be strong, he'll be athletic. A young South Asian is considered to be perhaps a bit too weak, you know. Maybe the, the paratha and the chapati will mean that he'll be pushed off the ball, you know. He won't be able to withstand the sort of physical muscularity, which is still part of the English game. I see that as an excuse. I think these are stereotypes that may have existed in the past but today's society you know they they don't actually they're not they're not true at all there's players in the premier league at international level the likes of messi and you know there's players all over the all over the world who are you know small in size and stature but uh, you know if if they can make it i can't see why our asians can't make it either diet is an issue of growing importance for south asian footballers Obviously diet's important, obviously you can't be overweight when you're playing football. I know that because I got injured, I've been out for about eight months. I can't wait and when I went back to play, I felt different, it was hard. 
Shahid Al Haq, father of Millwall youngster Yusuf, and 2013 Chelsea Asian star winner Mohamed Haq, believes diet is just one important factor for a player who wants to be successful. However, Chunky Singh Dillon, father of Stevenage defender Jay Singh Dillon, one of the few South Asian professionals playing league football, believes that coaches need to understand that not all South Asians have the same diet. To me, they haven't been educated, yeah? Not every Indian person eats chapati and curry every night. Me, my wife and my younger son, we eat a footballer's diet. If Jay's got a game and he's having pasta and all that lot, guess what I get for my packed lunch? Pasta. People look at my lunchbox, that's a bit healthy, isn't it? Are you going to eat all that before you go home? I go, if you eat healthy, you can eat as much as you want. They say, train, you've got to train well, sleep well and diet well. Very, very important. And diet for diet, I have to thank my wife, to be honest, because she puts so much, because we from Bangkok, we, we, we like rice and curry. And being a football, it's, it's man who doesn't fit, a rice and curry doesn't fit. But sometimes you're allowed to have a rice, it's not a problem. But at the same time, you need it because in, 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 in the, the dinner plate, they need to have a three kinds of food. Less than is your carbs, then there's a lot of protein, a lot of fruits and vegetables. West Ham Academy coach Anwar Udin had a 15 year professional career and captain sides including Barnet and Dagenham and Redbridge. He believes diet is not an issue that will make or break a football player. As kids, I think a lot of that is secondary. Yeah, it doesn't help, but it's not the be all and end all because you get used to it. You're, the body's a magnificent tool. It's the, it's the best thing you'll ever, you'll ever own. And if that's what you're used to, that's what you're used to. Uh, when I go to uh, Bangladesh, because uh, I have an academy in Bangladesh, and um, you know, what do you say to those kids? Because their diet is curry and rice. So you can't go over to an academy in Bangladesh and say, okay, well, if you're going to be the best you can be, go to a shop and buy some pasta and fish. They look at me and go, what's pasta? So that's life. And around the world, everyone has their own diets, but they manage to succeed in their own way. It's their interpretation of progress. A key determinant affecting the progression of Asians into professional football is parental support. If their child is talented, they should back him 100%, should, uh, you know, go to his matches, turn up, uh, you know, at all the events, you know what I mean? Have an idea of, you know, how well he's doing, you know. My dad getting up early and, you know, all these nights driving me up and down the country, driving me to training here, driving me to training there, taking me to a match at the other side of the country, you know, just everywhere. And, you know, financially they've supported me as well. Even, you know, when I went to Pakistan for the first time to play for the national team, basically what they said to me was, come out for two weeks as it on a trial basis. Obviously, Graham Roberts, who took me out there, who used to play for Tottenham, you know, they didn't take his word for it. You know, he does, he's good enough, he can, you know, he can play. But they go, right, we've not seen him play, but, you know, come out, but you're gonna have to pay for your own plane ticket. And my parents were like, okay, you know, we want you to go, because obviously it's, it's good experience and more opportunities will come with it. My mum and dad are taking me everywhere I needed to go, and like, my brother as well was like, it was just like, obviously I've been able to grow up and play with him as well, like football and that. So I've never been like, had to not have excuse to, I haven't had a, an excuse to not go out and play. My missus called Sunday male bonding in, our, in my house. She goes off to work, I've got to look after the two lads. So it used to be, either I go football or I stay at home and babysit. You know what? Get in the car, you're coming with me. I used to play and the subs used to stand there with Jay and he'd end up wandering on the pitch. Look, get a ball, just kick it with him. Thomas a tank engine, um, Wellington boots. He used to walk off the pitch, your boy kicks better than you. He's been kicking his ball for 90 minutes and he's all left foot. And I'm like, yeah. um, he's grown up in a football environment. Wherever I go, Dad, where are you off to? Football training. Where are you going? Five aside. Where are you going? Off to the gym. If you're drunk, 90% your son's going to grow up to be a drunk or one of your children. Yeah? If you're into football and your kid, all your kids that ever see you is going off to play football, well, what are they going to do? A six-year-old, seven-year-old son, you know, wants to go to football, son or a daughter now, you know, nowadays, any sport, but in particular football, if a parent doesn't take him down to the training session, how is he going to play? If it's maths and English, you do school, how many times? At least three times that they have the subject in the week. 
Plus, you're probably doing private tuition in England, all that kind of stuff. But football, do you want him to be football out? Do you want, how many times do you think? One rising star chasing the dream is 12-year-old Zidane Mir. He learned his trade as a footballer at the David Beckham Academy and with the Arsenal development squad. Sofian and Sheepa Mir have wholeheartedly supported their son's football career. He is enrolled at the Spire Institute in America on a long-term sports scholarship. You know, I have to support him through every aspect on and off the pitch. That is so important, off the pitch, Education does come first, but if he's going to be that footballer or that superstar, every aspect of that life, it's going to be monitored. And it has to be dissected to into many millions of pieces where it's taken back and think, this is the jigsaw to put together. Sophie and Mia has paid the highest price to give his son the best chance of becoming a professional footballer. Sheepa and Zidane have moved to America while he remains in London. I mean, the family's split apart. And it's a big sacrifice and I can shout it from the rooftop and say, you know, look at me and this is the sacrifice I'm doing. Or it's a great sacrifice. Or I can turn around and say to everybody and say, look, it's a great sacrifice, but what you have to understand and appreciate and acknowledge and accept the rewards are greater. You know, the, as soon as you start focusing on that, the rewards are greater. It, the whole situation becomes different. And it is, it's a, it's a full-time job, you know. It's a full-time job running, running them, taking the training when they come home, when he comes home, the diet, the sleep, uh, the mentoring, the guidance. It's uh, you, we did some work. We did some work with what Nicole, and uh, one of the greatest things he said to me is that you you have to embrace the journey 24/7, and you not what you have to accept is that you you're a parent grooming a superstar. Because if your son made it, he's going to be a global superstar. So don't wait until he becomes a superstar. Act upon he's going to be, become a superstar and look after him now. South Asians are often seen at football centres up and down the country playing amongst each other. You know, why is it that Asians want to play, play amongst a, a, Asians? It's a comfort zone. Oh, they love to stick within their own little communities. But that's not, a, that's not a problem, as long as the coaching that they're getting is the correct form of coaching in which they are now slowly getting to get. They are, they are scouting for players, they're going to look at the easiest and best options. Um, will they, on a, on a dark winter's night or, you know, a cold, wet day, travel all the way to watch an Asian team who they've never heard of, whose names they can't pronounce, and what, what is there in it, you know, for them? So I think that's a bit difficult. I never like try to just stay within like the Asian community. Like it's best to kind of like mix and like uh, just de develop together with everyone else. Really, yeah. yeah now Omar's been banging our doors for the last couple of years, and at the moment, obviously he's been playing Sunday football, Saturday. Now, unfortunately for him, he came out for the fruit season last season, and we had a set squad, set team, and he came trained and all that. But it's been great from this year because. He's had an opportunity to start, start again. Now he's impressed, even though he's been fasting. But the 20, 30 minutes, he's, he's earned himself a place, you know, and he's done really well. So it's someone giving him that opportunity. Because sometimes, us as coaches, we don't even trust our own. If they really want it, and if they don't make it a one club, and they think, you know, there's, that racially, you know, there's racism involved or whatever, then they should go to a different club. And the opportunities are always there. So don't, you know, stop at one club if, you know, he, not, not, not successful, go and knock on somebody else's door. It has become insular, and that is one of the criticisms of our culture. You know, it's, you know, I don't want to go and play for a mainstream team because I have to face the, the looks, the, you know, the animosity, the tension, I'm different, the racism. I'd rather go and play with my mates and be the best player. But, you know, in terms of your development, how far are you going to go in that environment? Yeah, it's great for the players that enjoy that. But if you want to break out into mainstream, you've got to go out on your own. You can do that, it's great. But to be the best, it, you know, it's, it's, it is a, it's a lonely uh, journey because you're going to be facing a situation where you are going to walk into a change room and you're the only brand face. No one knows you. And before you've even kicked a ball, people are asking questions of you. He's Asian. Can he play? Why is he here? Who is he? But how much do South Asian footballers fear discrimination? 
the packy stuff start coming out when we when we were really young. And this wasn't only just from the players, this was from the parents as well. I've seen Jay play football. I've seen Jay verbally abuse. Son, don't worry about it. It's the parents because they've had to pick it up from somewhere. Hopefully when that lad is a parent, he'll realise I don't have to use these foul, disgusting words. It was incredible, the volume. Um, I think because there were three of us. And as though, I'm not saying we were being targeted, but there wasn't any other club feeling three back players. So I think we got a lot of it. But, you know, it didn't really... You know, we, we grew up with abuse. The volume was different, but it wasn't a great shock at times. And also, because I think we're in such a good team, it helps um, because our team is also very supportive, but we just got on with it. And it gave us a great deal of delight, especially when we played away from home, to stick our chests out, probably stick our fingers up as well as we walked on the pitch, knowing that we've um, we've taken all the points. So it's something that you just um, we knew wasn't going to change. The authorities are doing nothing about it. So I think our attitude, I think the attitude for most black players of my era is we'll see you next week, next month, next year, you're not going to drive us away. You had to be thick-skinned, you had to take on certain abuse by players and I wouldn't say the management was directly uh, a racist or anything, but sometimes you did wonder. You did wonder, am I not being picked because I'm not the right colour? Within the players, yeah. It was a very apparent because it was that train um, nickname was called Pax to certain people, and that was a nickname was for Packy, um, and it wasn't nice. Um, but it's part of the journey, and you had to um, either be strong and fight it through, or you know just not say nothing and just keep it within yourself. I've had my dad come into a dressing room once. We played in the cup final uh, for my district. And it was 1-1, one, one, it's going to extra time, I was knackered and we've gone back into the changing room for a quick like, pep talk. So he's coming to the changing room, obviously it's embarrassing as a kid, you know, your dad getting involved, like, what are you doing, dad? But it's, it's twice as bad for me because he's coming to the changing room, he's like, come on boys, you know, and my dad's English is, is not the greatest, but you tell me a uh, first generation Bangladeshi man who has got great English. And he went and I'm like, dad, man, what are you doing? And I remember, like, the coach obviously then done his bit and a, a couple of boys like, oh, look, who was that effing Packy just coming in, mate? What was all that about? And I'm just sitting there, I'm like, yeah. And like, I remember um, Ashley Cole. Ashley Cole said, that's Anwar's dad. It happened to me that often, like, it's kind of shocking, but I don't, like, not to say I don't care, but I don't really let it affect me. Like, I will just, I just, I just think I'm better than the other person anyway, so, like, he's not going to, like, say it if I was worse than him. I think, I think in professional sport, any professional sport, you need to have a certain resilience to get to where you'd like to get to. You know, I mean, I think once you've got a prefix professional football against you, you know that there are not many who make it to that level. There's a, there's a huge fallout. Um, roughly 75, 80 percent of boys who start the um, football careers at 16 are, are out again by the time they're 21. So it's very, very competitive. So I think you need a certain amount of resilience. You have to take a break back to your disappointments you have to overcome lots of things yeah, it's definitely should be something that we need to look at because it does cause great offense and i mean that word with me has just haunted me throughout my whole life and it was just something that was just constantly used to cause offense and it worked and it's sort of like it just haunts me i've had dates before with a, with a girl and i've really really been looking forward to it and it was like yep yeah, yeah, i'm nervous going to the house do you want a cup of coffee yeah brilliant yeah i'll have a car i've got no milk oh, do you want to just pop to the package shop It is hoped initiatives such as the Asian Football Awards can promote greater understanding of the role of South Asians in football in the UK. AFA founder Baljit Rahal is keen to point out that the awards have a much greater focus than simply increasing the on-field presence of Asian footballers. In terms of the AFA, um, it's a, a platform, so it's, it's an industry award. Uh, it's not just about the players, but um, it, is, it focuses on on uh, role models. It's also about people who are grassroots coaches, it's about people who are in administration, like people who are on um, boards of football clubs for example, um, people who are like commercial directors, people who are in the medical side, so doctors, physios etc. So it's a very very broad spectrum of the football industry. We are focusing on an underrepresented group, quite similar to women's football. That's what we're trying to do with the Asian um, the diaspora. Well, I think the, the part of the Asian Awards is obviously raising the profile because they're, they're actually, they're actually um, 
having nominees from a very small pool in a different category. But I think what it shows is that the Asians are involved in football in all areas, not just on the um, playing side. So I think in that sense, it's, it's, it's been good, and I think it's, um, it's a nice platform to showcase what Asians are achieving within the game. But what does the future hold for South Asian footballers in the UK? I think you are going to see a big difference hopefully in the next 10-15 years. I think it's important that you know, for the future, things are now in place. People are talking about Asians in football. People have produced academies and facilities to encourage Asians in football. You know, and, and I hope now it's down to individuals and parents. Even if their kids play in the Ryman's League, you should be happy. That should be a target. Well, that should be a baseline drop down. Right, okay, Chelsea's here, can't get in there, he's gonna try it at least here. I think this will take perhaps another generation. If the next generation is gonna come through, the, the parents has to be a key factor. The thing is, not, not everybody is gonna make it at Chelsea or Man United or Real Madrid. Yeah. They're not gonna make it, uh, uh, some are not, are not gonna make it football league level. Mm. Some aren't gonna make it a conference level. Mm. But you know what the most important thing is? Participation. Through struggles to success, the British South Asian soccer story continues. There are currently six British South Asians playing in the Football League. Michael Chopra is at Blackpool. Danny Bath is at Wolverhampton Wanderers. Malvin Benning is at Walsall. Ash Siddiqui is at Northampton Town. Jay Singh Dillon is at Stevenage. And Josh Sharma is at Oxford United. Two are in the Premier League. Neil Taylor is at Swansea City. And Adil Nabi is at West Bromwich Albion. And waiting in the wings are two young starlets. Former West Brom youngster Jan Danda is now at Liverpool. He is the first British Asian to sign for the Merseyside club. Zidane Mia is continuing his development at the Spire Institute in Ohio, which is also a US Olympic training site. He is also trained at Real Madrid.